Okay, we've adapted the uh, time scales and the time line. Yes. I'm going for the long line, so that you can more sensibly connect this together. So it's the same people, just in reverse order. But first, one bit of housekeeping. Uh, based on a test case this morning, it does seem that the driver that we need to fix the Copart people's machines is now in our possession. And so if through the course of the day or the stop days you come and see me, I can help you sort that out. Um, and the EcoPath coder also said that he'll work with me to get a Mac version going by this time next year. So that's a major advance as well in my life. So that was good. Okay, so I'm about to talk to you now about model coupling. So I mentioned this a little bit yesterday. Uh, it gets to be a whole topic by itself today. And it's about coupling things at different scales. This is an image here that sort of indicates where things that live at very different scales start to interact with the way you might want to do this kind of thing. So as I mentioned yesterday, we've been looking at the global climate issues and global change for a long time now. And the main way that that was built up in models was actually by coupling, by coupling different processes, almost in a linear chain initially. So you build up the components separately and link them together, which is what you can see here, where they've gone from the land and the ocean, which were originally loosely coupled to be much more integrated. Then they got truly coupled uh, climate models where the ice was initially simply linked and then more integrated and so on. They've added the different processes initially as a very simple couple and then more integrated as they, as they went along. The part that they haven't integrated in yet is the human bits. So we still do that in a couple slides. So again, I mentioned yesterday that for some times they had to embed these finer scale processes and sometimes you do it by coupling. So if it's a new process that you want to bring in, you typically, typically represent it out of sight of the system first to, so you can get your bugs mainly out of the way before you integrate it. But there can be issues in doing that coupling if they're happening at different scales. And this highlights a case where, particularly on the boundaries, how you deal with those boundaries at different scales at the boundaries is a key problem of all the coupling issues. So in the his my history of being a modeler over the last 20 years, it's been interesting watching the physics world suddenly realise that there's something beyond physics. So the, the development of dynamic marine models in, um, in this discipline has really evolved from the physics world being physics alone and not really want to talk to anybody else to sequentially adding these things as they realised that they were important. So when I first started interacting with the physics world, they were having huge problems with parts of the ocean which didn't really work. Um, and they were convinced that they just had a problem with their equation and it was a closure term and all these other kind of things. Then they realised that biology and chemistry draws down heat into the ocean. So the plankton absorbs you know, the plankton, by doing its stuff, absorbed some of the temperature. It was part of the problem. By missing a biophysical process, they actually couldn't nail down the physics because the biology was actually a key part of it. And there's still the closure term in most physics models that's about the same size as tide and wind. That's how they sort of mop up the other processes, okay? What all those other processes are is a thing called Darwinian circulation. It was discovered by Charles Darwin's grandson. And it's the movement of things like fish and zooplankton up and down in the water column that stirs the ocean to about the same level of tide and winds do. But it's completely ignored at an explicit process level by the physicists because it's not a physical process. It's a point of fun that I like to have with my physics friends down in home. So this is the evolution of the way that remodeling is happening. I tend to think of the social science stuff on the end as the hard stuff. It's much harder than any of the other stuff despite what some people would tell you. Uh, and if you look at models, these stuff have now become integrated as have these to some extent. True integration across all of them hasn't happened. So originally you had coupling here and that's now become integration and you've had coupling here which is becoming more integrated. But because there's not true integration across all of them yet, coupling still has a large part to play when you're looking at a whole socio-ecological system. This is again a slide you saw yesterday, but it's just to reinforce that initially these were linear connections being made between the different steps in the processes. 
So temperature was driving a primary production model, which was driving a, effectively a statistical model of the forage, which then was linked, both a physics and this one, linked to identify where larvae would go, which then allowed you to have where the adults were. And it was a linear chain of connections without too much feedback within. And that's the typical evolution of one of these big models, is that coupling plays the key role in doing that. We can see that in the evolution of global global climate models. So, you know, as much as 20 years ago when they were doing this, it would take five to six years to do this process. So they would have a human a model of the human system, uh, and then that would predict emissions under different scenarios of human development and industrial development. Those emission scenarios would then be used to force a global climate model. Uh, which would chuck out its values, which in turn was often used to condition downscale models to look at direct impacts. From that, they'd get a look at the knock-on social and economic impacts to see if their scenarios back here made sense. So this was a five to even in some case ten year process to do all this. So you can imagine that trying to update the IPCC was a bit slow at that time. It's got a bit faster now, and I'll get to that in a second, but the key part of the problem that that kind of very linear chain has is not just the slowness of the whole thing, but the pathway. So this is an example where they've coupled an, uh, a simple production model to fish, or a simple fish model to a detailed production model, and you can see this kind of one link point. What that ignores is there's actually multiple pathways through a system. And the, the direction of flow of that pathway can sometimes be really important to the outcome. So even if you are coupling, you might want to do it in such a way where it's more than just a sit. At one point, oh. you did well. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm going to go off. You might want to swap out the um, so the, you want to think about where you've got multiple links and how you might want to have multiple link points across uh, an ecosystem, uh, across the coupling. Okay, so they're starting to be a bit more dynamic in that sense with linking integrated assessment models and, and GCMs. So that, that process is a lot faster. So in the old days, this used to be an email or a written letter where they'd send the information from one model to the other. Now it's a, it's a bit faster in how they define those interactions, but it's still not truly integrated. They still have to go from one to the other. Some of the Earth system models that are trying to tie people and, and the, the physical processes together are getting closer, but they're not there yet. So one of the key problems in doing this is how do you get the downscale patterns? So it might be okay to say the global scale is going to be heaps of development and really high emissions. But that's not going to, as we saw yesterday from Laurent, that's not going to be uniform across the whole planet. So you immediately have, uh, first of all, a spatial scale problem of how do you take an overall amount and spread it, allocate it around the world. But there's also the temporal problem. So a really common coupling problem in the, the water quality world is that the catchment models of what's happening on land and the loads going to the rivers are given at an annual scale but the ocean models are happening at a minute to a half day scale. So how do you take that annual load and put it into the ocean? So the easiest one is just the spirit. We'll talk about that in a minute. But that doesn't reflect the fact that in reality it's usually quite large floods, which has knock-on effects on the biology. So as soon as you're trying to couple two models, the, the heterogeneity in how you handle that thing is really important. And so that's why they're starting to try to build these Earth system models where they have more direct and interacting connections between them. So if we think about the different scales involved, uh, resilience theory says that there's sort of three scales and three main things to think about. I actually expand that out a bit further. So you've got your sort of main topic areas and your main spatial and temporal scales. So any one problem that you're thinking about actually has components across all those scales. You might not want to explicitly, you know, if it was me, I'd try to build this into an integrated explicit model, but I'd couple in these kind of pressures, either as simple drivers or by bringing in time series out of another model. So not all coupling has to be live when both models are running at the same time and talking. You can run one model and take its output and make it as an input, a time series input to another model. That's often how you can get around the difference in time step issues. So for instance, in an ecosystem model, 
the physics models might take three to six months to run. And then you're not going to be able to do an awful lot of ecological modeling if you've got to wait six months for every single simulation to spit out. So what we do is we take a physics model that's already been run, we take the time series out of that, we use that to drive the physical circulation in our models, we get our run done on the Achilles running on my computer right now, it's going to take about an hour and a half. So that's a lot faster than six months. So how have we done at trying to patch across all the different processes on these different scales? Well, we do pretty good at modelling the fine scale, we do pretty good at modelling parts of the global scale, though we don't do social and cultural management well in models at the scales. So you often see these models become the core of a model with simple coupling to other scales. So there is some experience on doing models at this scale, and it's easiest to couple to the scale right beside you. The biggest challenges come when you try to jump scale, so like it's coupling from there to there, for instance. And that's when you can really trip up. So it's a little bit hard to see this, um, this light green patch here, this amoeba, it's a lot darker on my machine. But the same way you go about building an intermediate complexity model is the way to go about identifying both the things to couple, but also the couple linkage points. So you can see this fuzzy kind of line in here. So this would be one model. This would be another model. You know, each of these major boxes would be a model. And there's a few linkage points in each spot. So in this particular case, we've identified one or two key points that we could join together. But we could actually have multiple arms coming out if they didn't all come easily. So there might be something, for instance, that's affecting seagrass from, say, fishing mortality. Say the boats rip up the seagrass. You could bring in extra link in here. So, the same kind of simple qualitative models that we saw earlier today, conceptual models like these are how you identify some of your linkage points. So you can start to think through whether you need multiple linkage points, and so what are your problems with trying to link across the scales. Now the reason to do linkage is that it can open up a whole bunch of questions you couldn't think about before. This is a diagram from uh, computer science about how to develop uh, our games. So if you make a game too simple, it's boring. If you make it too hard, people get really anxious and give up on it. It's pretty much the same in models. Uh, if you're just doing the same thing in your own little discipline all the time, it gets routine and a bit boring. If you try and just like combine everything at once, it can be a very exciting life, but also a bit stressful. Uh, so you try to find a sweet spot bot between, to say that there's a few aspects of the different um, parts of the system that you want to link up so that you can get some useful information out of it without making your life a living hell. So the easiest way to do that is to take existing models for different parts of the system and have a communication between them. That's a lot easier than trying to put it all in one piece of software. So these brokers are often either just by taking a time series from one and literally feeding it into the other, or you can have live links between them. And that's where you use um, little bits of software, a bit like a mailing system. And the easiest way that we've found to do it is actually to use the packet transfer information from the way the internet does. So we have, we start these models and then we have a little broker in the, in the center that says, is connected to these and says, tell me when something changes. So every time something changes in these models, the broker knows about it and has a list of rules about how it transfers information between them. So that these models don't have to know that these exist. All that they know is that they send, they get information from here. It's packaged in a way that they already know how to handle. This thing does all the conversions and hands it off as needed. So it's pretty simple. It's like having a letter between friends, effectively. And when they open the letter, that's the new piece of information to act on. So the motivation of the couple of the examples that I'll show you uh, is around trying to understand how changes in the physical environment can affect top predators. In particular, the little fairy penguin. I don't know if you've ever seen a fairy penguin. They're about this big, they're the ultimate and cute. So we had a biogeochemical model of the region already developed to look at the impacts of salmon farming. We had an ecospace model of the food web in the system. And we had an agent-based model, that's not a little penguin, that's just because I couldn't find a good picture of a little penguin. But we had an agent-based model of penguins that were living in the area. We wanted a really <laughs> rapid way of being able to take this output and find what the effect of salmon farms would be on these guys. 
So we needed some way of transferring that information rapidly to them without having to embed them in this and take seven months to rerun this model. Okay. So the way that we did that was that we took the Ecospace uh, food web and we had the NPZD food web. In the end, we ended up having to use a program called Atlantis to represent the plankton part because the, the uh, biogene chemistry model uh, had to be used for something else. It was turning out to be a little bit slow to do the test, but the principle is the same. So if we just think about the plankton model at the lower end, and we've picked, we've picked the part where we can slot it in and out. So this part here was represented by just a couple of groups in Ecospace, and it's been teased out more, much more detail here. So a couple of the people who are experienced with plankton models realised yesterday that there's no nutrient limitation in the ecos part of the Greco space, and that production is pretty simply handled. handled. This is a way of expanding that by linking it to an NPZD that already has all those features in it, and just worrying about how that then feeds up through the rest of the system. So the idea was to let the um, the BGC, the, the plankton model, do its thing and then send information around the system. So the plankton model was working on a time step of six hours, whereas these things have a time step of a month. So it would do, it work up its month worth of changes and it hand off the biomass of plankton to the ecopath model, which would then do the rest of the food web. It would send back how much of the biomass of plankton had changed, how much the tritus had been produced. That would then be put back into the, the plankton model. So the tricky parts in here was that this is a fully 3D model and this is a 0D model that didn't actually have any space. So the, the first test was to try and do a 0D and we thought, okay, take that one out of the mix, my head is already hurting. Let's at least make this one 2D so that we can do some simple spatial mapping. So we picked an area where we had really good observational data to be able to check the models against to make sure that it was all making sense. You'll notice that there's already one additional spatial problem is that we were using polygons in this model and a grid in this model. We also had to try and match habitat types and depth types across them, so that's problem number one. They also had a mismatch in trophic resolution, so we had to figure out who to link with. So this one replaced that one, this one replaced that one, but then we had to try and figure out how to best aggregate that. Was it a simple average? Had they really left parts of this out when they made this model over here, or could we just sum them together? So we had to initially identify which was equivalent to which, so that these just straight replaced. We wrote over the values in ecospace with these values every time it executed. So the spatial mapping um, involved taking the polygons and putting it into the grid. So then you've got the question about whether you just pro rata it, so the proportional allocation of the polygon to the grid, or whether you have to use a fancier interpolation screen, uh, scheme. The other one, the more complicated one, was time. So do you just take a simple average of what's happening or do you try and make it more event-based? So we have very fine scale things happening in the plankton world, but then a monthly ecosim event. So do you take the values here and then just take the values coming out of ecosim and smear that pressure through time, or do you do a slightly different approach? So you can have the continuous smear, or you can have the NPZD coming along and comparing itself to what's coming out of the eco part, and then only update if what's happened is outside a band, a variable band. So if you think that this value is about average and it happens to match what was in the last eco path step, then you don't bother interrupting the NPZD. It's only when an event happens that you do an update. And that's exactly how your operating system happens. It's paying attention to the mouse, but it's not reacting to the mouse until you do something. And then it goes, oh, I've got to change the mouse is on the screen. So it's event-based. And that's exactly how this was driven. So we tried both. Um, they both have their pros and cons. So it's always good to try the, the two different rates. The first problem is that there were significant technical difficulties every time we tried to deal with the, the, top, the spatial scale and the temporal scale, and the whole thing would blow up. Um, my children were quite got to a stage where they'd love to hear the latest accident that we've had when trying to do this work. We did eventually get it working. So the base Atlantis for the, the plankton model is here. This is without the upper food web involved. This is the EWE model outcome without being coupled. So it's got the very simple plankton. 
So once you couple them, you've got this line in the middle. So it's not exactly in the middle. But you can see that this lower trophic level stuff is starting to much more influence what's happening in the, in the higher trophic levels and the feedback that's coming back to other load. So the most important part for us was that when you perturb the system, you actually got a different pathway in the eco-space model cropping up depending on whether it was coupled or uncoupled. So the fact that you had a more explicit plankton model informing it, even though it didn't have any other changes inside the ecospace model, led to different outcomes in the ecospace model, particularly spatial. So in the future of this kind of stuff, and I'll get to one last example before I'm finished, there is, it's about linking more and more of these things uh, in that kind of platform, of linking more explicitly to climate models, to other agent-based models, but what we found is it's if you can get past, you get your head around how to do that temporal and spatial linking, it is a really fast way of getting the best leverage off the different model types uh, and then pulling in different information, so pulling in social information, say from your instance. Uh, but it does present some challenges. So the other example I'm going to show you is one I forgot to show you yesterday, but it's still worth. Sorry, that's a different model, right? This is an uh, um, example of, it's got a, it's in that logo, it's got a grid based plankton model underneath it and then it has patches of fish and single fishermen moving around. So it couples the multiple different models, so it couples a population model, the plankton model and the agent based model to explore the impacts of those marine protected areas in the middle. The best part about this was it was built by the students at, in Turkey at the Klimeco meeting there. So it was done in an afternoon by people who'd never used that logo before, but there was a plankton modeler, there was a fisheries population modeler, and a person who knew a little bit about fleet dynamics, and they just sat together and they made this. In fact, we got about six or seven good working models out of that logo in that particular case. So in the group, exercises that you do, there is the potential to have some really interesting science come out within the course of the meeting. And these guys, I don't think they ended up writing a paper about it, but they certainly put it online and there have been other papers from the other project models that came out. So that's my example from Kapuri. Are there any questions before we go over to uncertainty? So a group of scientists used a qualitative modelling approach to explore scenarios and I quantitatively modelled it in the same way, we saw if we came to the same outcomes. On the back of that, the fishermen realised and the managers realised they didn't have to follow the same rules they've always been using, that they had other options. It would be expensive at the start or painful at the start to change, but it would make them more sustainable. So they went to the Australian government and they, they talked with the Australian government, so the fishermen and the managers. And the Australian government put $250 million on the table and restructured all of Australia's fisheries. So the kind of coupled models that we talk about here have been used to make really big management decisions around the world. It's so part of the motivation to move to economic yield instead of just food, because Australia has enough food as it be. That side, so economic yield was a more beneficial outcome for us. So it's used on a regular basis. 